so vivid Such vibrant shades of grey And here beneath the ice and snow Is life hiding away Oh, to hear us singing once again Oh, the way we did way back when Look at us, we are only children But that was now and this is then When the wind has blown away What the cold had left behind Where the remnants once had been It comes again so does a season end So does a season end What we have been is new What you have been is perfect What I have been is you oh, To hear us singing once again Oh, the way we did oh, way back when Look at us, we are only children A season end. Mm -hmm. So does a season end. Does a season end? So does a season Also, um, we had the pleasure of having him sing that song and work with Shanti Webb and Cornell Kinderknecht at the um, Solstice Eve Ritual, which was fabulous. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I know that those of you who were there um, uh, really enjoyed it with Brother Chi Singh in the Dallas Meditation Center. And we had the opportunity of um, ushering in the solstice. And so that's, of course, what we're talking about today as we um, carry on with our Feast of Lights. Today we're talking about the winter solstice and subatomic light. Are you ready? <laughs> They're like, oh, okay, we have no idea what those two things have to do with each other. That is okay. Well, you know, partly we, have to, um, we always have to find a new way to engage in these rituals because they come around every year, don't they? Over and over and over again. It's like, oh my goodness, are we going to talk about anything new? 
Uh, and so that's, that, to me, is one of the beauties of the fact that these rituals come around every year. And we're constantly invited to dig a little deeper and go a little further and reach a little fuller into the spiritual depth and meaning that's available to us instead of constantly just skipping over the surface and saying, yeah, 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 here we are again. We have the same picture from this Christmas that we had last Christmas and the Christmas before that, right? And so we keep going a little deeper and find a, a way to... Um, to um, allow these uh, ideas and these rituals to really work us, to work us a little more um, open and a little more available to the presence of the divine and to the one. So, you know, we always talk about winter solstice, right? It's the longest night and the shortest day, and we know that it's a very ancient tradition. It's the ancient of all of these Feast of Lights. It is actually where we got our solstice tree, our Christmas tree, and the notion of putting lights on it and bringing greenery into the household um, and all of that sort of thing. And of course, it was all done to ward off the dark and to remember that in spite of the darkness, it's still light and the sun is shining behind the clouds and that sort of thing. And, and um, big bonfires would be built and people would dance around it and they would um, um, beat on the drums and have this giant bonfire. And part of it was to ward off the darkness and to scare away the evil spirits, and as well as to pray for the sun to rise again the next day. Well, I'm thinking that we actually know the sun's going to rise the next day, and that we don't actually have to do that. We don't actually have to engage in that ritual. And also we know in the science of mind, we don't actually contend with the darkness, do we? We don't believe in a duality. We don't actually believe in this... Um, idea that the light and the dark are constantly fighting each other. Even though, of course, we see it not only in our, the spiritualities in which many of us grew up in, but also in the media and, you know, Star Wars and all those, you know, and the men in the white hats and the men in the black hats, and off they go fighting each other. We don't actually teach that. We, have, we don't actually understand that that's the way the universe works. We actually understand that, it's, that there's a oneness, a unity, um, and fundamentally, there's only light. So, well, what's darkness? Where does darkness come from? I remember first contemplating this long time ago when I was in ministerial school, because of course I was raised Catholic with the notion of, of evil, and I, I love those movies where good and evil contend, and of course, I don't watch it unless good wins. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't have anything to do with it otherwise. And, um, and so thinking about this and really exploring this, like how does that work? How do, we, how do we experience that or see that a little differently? And I remember thinking, well, when you go into a dark room, what happens when you turn the light switch on? What happens to the dark? It just disappears, doesn't it? It doesn't fight back. There's no dark switch. You don't, you don't, right? You don't, you don't turn the dark on as you leave the room. You turn out the light. You don't have switches that you play back and forth with. Should we have light? Should we have dark? There's only a light switch. <laughs> Something to contemplate. Yes, there's only a light switch. There's actually no dark switch. It's just the absence of light. And so when we go into a room and we turn the light on, the dark just disappears. Because there's light brought in. Do you see? So this is what we're going to explore this morning. How do we bring in the light? How do we bring it in? And where does it come from? And, and what is it? And what does that mean for us as individuals? <coughs> so we're almost done with our Joyous Living Journal. I hope you have been following along all year. Um, we are um, at Subatomic Light. This is for today. At the subatomic level, everything is made of light. These packets of light are constantly winking in and out of existence. What causes them to keep winking back into, an exist into existence in the place they were before? Habit, expectation, observation. In other words, consciousness. Change any of these aspects of consciousness, change your expectations, your habits, or what you're paying attention to, and things wink back into existence in a new place. This is the basis for healing, growth, and transformation. Yeah, wow, I was right, right? So, 
So science has come to the point where it's beginning to understand uh, that there is this fundamental building block of the universe and it's not the atom. It's actually this thing called energy. And energy actually shows up as light, as photons of light. These little photons of light are actually packets of information. And that, those packets of information, those little photons of light, that's what all of this is made out of. That's what, where all of this uh, finds its, its substance, something as insubstantial as energy and light. Ernest Holmes says it this way, we are all thinking, willing, knowing, conscious centers of life. We are surrounded by, immersed in, and there is flowing through us a creative something. Call it what you will. We might call it God, the thing itself. We might call it the force, the universe. We might call it Jesus or Buddha. In science, we call it energy or light, this creative something that is the moving force, that is the driving expression of life moving into creation. And, and from the science, we're discovering that that's light. That expression is fundamentally light. So, so just like the light in the room, we ourselves, are light. We are beings of light. We are created out of that place of light. And yeah, we don't have a dark switch. We should think about that for a minute. We don't actually have a dark switch. We don't actually believe in the inherent or even possible evil or darkness of human beings. There's no dark switch. And we don't actually have to contend with our own darkness. Years ago, I was counseling with somebody, working with someone who was going through a divorce. And you know those times when it gets sticky, when you have to have the conversations. And going into that conversation thinking, oh my god, what's going to happen? Often, going into that conversation, I don't expect this to go well. or. I'm not really sure how this is going to go. You see, and when we move into those conversations, this gentleman was constantly having to struggle with, what is this going to look like? How is this going to be? How is it going to show up? And every moment, he had the opportunity of asking himself and asking me, well, how do I want to be? How do I want to be? Do I want to contend with the potential darkness? Or do I want to be the light? Do I want to just be the light? And so we did prayer for love and grace and light. Not to change the other person, but to allow the truth of our being to shine through. That's the choice we're confronted with all the time. We're always invited into that choice. And it's not that we contend with darkness, our own or someone else's. The question is, are we going to be the light? Are we going to bring the light? Now, this light that we are, we don't actually have to turn on. Unlike the electrical switch, when you go into the room, you have to turn on the light. This light, we do not actually have to turn on. You don't have to be any more spiritual to have this light. You don't have to meditate this morning. You don't have to pray. You don't have to beseech God. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything other than, being the tr than, other than be you. You see, in science, they have this new thing called biophotonics. Biophotonics. I practiced that word this morning. <laughs> Biophotonics. There you go. This is an image of a young man. This is the low level light that is being captured by these new um, photography sensors. This is the low level light that we are constantly emitting just by being alive. And we've seen this light in ancient drawings, the halo, the rays of light that we see that's depicted off of the saints and the sages from every faith tradition, people who see auras and see energy fields and see patterns, right? We're seeing this light 
This is the very truth of our being. This light doesn't have to be turned on. It is simply constantly being generated by the very essence of our life itself. So when someone says to you, when I say to you, you are a radiant, magnificent being of light, do you see? I am so very serious about that. I'm not affirming something that I hope is true about you. I'm affirming something that is true about you. And when you say that about yourself, no matter what it might feel like in the moment, you're actually speaking truth about yourself. Even if you feel stupid or separate or, or like you've just made this major faux pas or like you have no clue as to what to do next or you feel as though you have to ask somebody for forgiveness or you are angry and resentful, despite all of those things, what is true is that you are a radiant, magnificent being of light because that's what we're made out of. And there's no switch that we have to turn on. Now, we do get to uncover it and, 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 and we get to remove the things that are standing in the way. Our fear, our doubt, all of those things that, that go on that cover our light. But the light is always there. So there's also an understanding that when we are um, in experiences like this, when we're in relationship one-on-one -on -one or we're in a room like this, what's happening is that you and I, we're, we are exchanging photons of light all the time, constantly. We are connected on this web of light. And we're literally exchanging those photons constantly. Sometimes we're doing that very brightly and very effortlessly and very easily and people experience our joy and they experience our glow. You're glowing. You look so great. Isn't that wonderful? You're, you're, and, and sometimes they don't experience that of us, <laughs> right? Or we don't experience that of ourselves. And so we're somehow, we have contracted that. We have we're withholding that light, or we're veiling it, or we're covering it. And our light isn't shining as brightly. And people say to us, well, you feel a little dark, a little dense. There's some heaviness about you. Do you see? They're sensing that, that there's something impeding this flow, this exchange of light. And so we can really take a moment to take a look at, well, what is that? Well, I don't know about you. I'm thinking that like you, like me, you have the experience where you have those, where you can have those moments where something happens and you have that rush of <gasps> panic or fear or anger or resentment. Something gets triggered within us and there's that flood of feeling. Somebody looks at us funny, something happens, we hear about layoffs at work, there's a challenge out in the world, there's something going on and there's that flood of feeling. And everything begins to contract and close down, doesn't it? I'll never forget the experience I had <laughs> when I was living in my cabin in the woods, my mother had come and to visit and we were, we were hanging curtains. I, I'll never forget it, we were, we were ironing the curtains, we were getting ready to hang it. We, I lived out in this cabin that was quite a ways out in the mountains and so um, there was no reception, no TV, no radio, whatever. I had a shortwave radio. And so occasionally I would tune in and listen to what was going on in the world and so we had the shortwave radio on. We were listening to the news. <laughs> the BBC on it, because it was one of the things that I could get, and I loved listening to their English accents, which is very great. And we were listening to it, and it was the day that they, um, that desert storm began. And I'll never forget, here we were in the mountains, my mother and I, out in the middle of nowhere, listening to the shortwave radio, hearing that war had begun and that we had declared war. And my mother fell to her knees and started sobbing 
because it immediately put her back into the basement, the bomb shelters in her home in Germany, listening to the illegal radio, listening to BBC um, report on the war in Germany, the Second World War, and what was going on. And I watched my mother fall into herself <coughs> and be so sad and so angry. Haven't we figured this out yet? Don't we know that this is not the way? My mother was, wrote a book um, in her late, later years, in her late 60s. She wrote a beautiful book on this time period. She was um, in the um, Nazi Germany as a non-Nazi, non-Jew, um, as an adolescent. And she ends her book with this quote. Um, I don't know who to attribute it to. Um, and the quote is, the only evil there is in the world is when good men and women sit aside and do nothing. And what, is, and what is it for us to do? What is there for us to do? Particularly if we understand that there's nothing to contend with. Ernest Holmes says we should be for something and against nothing. We're against nothing because there's nothing to be against. There isn't darkness to fight. There isn't evil to fight. There's only to be for something. And so, and so to learn the lessons from past relationships, from past wars, from past experiences that we've had in our own lives and to discover that when we operate out of fear or resentment, out of anger or out of our own doubt, we are literally veiling and closing off and constricting this light that we are. And the other option is to bring the light, which means that we actually have to open those doors. We have to unveil, unmask. We have to release whatever is standing between us and that situation, whatever that experience might be that we're having that allows this light to shine. There's a wonderful quote in one of the Carlos Castaneda books, um, this written by Dan Millman, and he says this, every positive change, every jump to a higher level of energy and awareness involves a rite of passage. Each time to ascend to a higher rung on the ladder of personal evolution, we must go through a period of discomfort, of initiation. I have never found an exception. I've never found an exception. Is it possible that in fact the dark that we contend with or that we think that we have to engage with is actually this period of discomfort, this initiation that we're being invited into to do it differently? That, and the discomfort it is to actually declare, uh, I'm going to release my resentment. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to actually be love in the room despite what's going on and and how that is a practice and that we have to be over and over and over again initiated into the practice of being the very light that we are and letting it shine and letting it out and it can be uncomfortable and we have to go through the period of discomfort until finally we reach that place where we are willing to be the light. So it's always an interesting thing as a minister to um, confront how much of one's personal life is to be shared um, from the platform and, and how much of it feels useful. So it's always a little bit of a razor's <laughs> edge, a delicate balance, but I do want to share something from my own personal life because it's been... Um, it's been a walk, um, and it's been an opportunity for me to practice this. As you know, most of you know, my relationship ended at the beginning of this year. Uh, it's been almost, it's been a, a year now that um, that relationship has been over with my previous partner, who is a practitioner here, Susan, practitioner here. Um, and what a challenging walk that was for us as we separated and as she tried to figure out, can I be here? How does that work? How do we be together in this place? Are we able to? And um, we discovered that that was challenging. It was challenging for her to be here 
and to be in this space because there was discomfort between us. And I remember over and over and over again thinking to myself, well, well, surely there's a way we can get over this hump. Surely there's enough love. Surely there's enough way to be uh, together that, that we can move through this gracefully. But we found that challenging. And so as you know, um, Susan was transferred and has moved. And we had the opportunity here to say goodbye to her. And we had the opportunity to have a lovely, the practitioners had the opportunity to have a lovely gratitude circle for her. And I didn't go because that discomfort was still playing out between us. Over and over and over again, trying to initiate love, trying to be initiated into how do we do it differently, continuing to experience that discomfort. <coughs> and so we actually had to exchange some last things before she um, took her U-Haul and drove away. We actually had to exchange some last minute things and, and I was bound and determined to have it be different. So asking for prayer, actually for my dear friend Karen, asking for prayer. How do I want to be? I want to be the place where love and light shows up. I want to be the place where love and light shows up. Really doesn't matter. Do you see? It doesn't matter how the other person behaves. It doesn't matter how they show up. It doesn't matter what they're doing. How do I show up? Not just, not how do I show up. Choosing to show up that way. Do you see? What it means is we're choosing to be who we are. We're choosing to be the light instead of all the other things that we could be. The resentment or the anger or the disappointment or the sadness or the why can't you be different and shouldn't you change and all of those kinds of things. And so she came to the house and we had the exchange and, and we were able to have that moment. I remember why I love you. I remember why we loved each other so much. I remember that I still love you. I still want the best for you. And let's find our way back to friendship. Do you see that's available to us when we are willing to be the light, to be the light that we already are, and to bring it in this, into the situation, to declare it over and over and over again. We're not affirming it, hoping it's true. We're affirming it because it is true, and the affirmation brings it to our conscious awareness. And we can walk through the discomfort, and we have to be initiated into what does it mean? What does it look like to behave that way, to speak that way, to see with those eyes? Can we see with those eyes of light? Or are we still seeing with the eyes of judgment or anger or whatever it is that we have for a person or for a situation. And so we allow ourselves to be initiated. Now this initiation in the subatomic, at the subatomic level, it is called the quantum leap. It is called the quantum leap because you see, there's this fabulous um, image here. This is Neil Bohr's image of the subatomic, uh, um, of the atomic particle. And you'll notice it's quite different than what we learned in school. It's not the little tinker toys uh, or solar system. It's actually these spheres. And in the center are the protons and the neutrons. And the spheres are the, is where the electron is the orbit of the electron. And all those little blue lines are all the places where the electron might be all the places where the electron has the potential of being. But we don't actually know where the electron is until we look at it. And in the moment of looking at it, we can pinpoint that electron. And the most amazing thing is that the electron can shift its orbit. It can move from that inner orbit to that outer or orbit. And when it does so, that's when these photons of light are released. And when it moves from the inner to the outer orbit, it does so without taking up space or time. Yeah, really. Hmm. Okay, let's think about that for a minute. Okay, let's like really think about that. 
So, so this is a subatomic particle, okay, but you have to imagine that for the electron, this is the size of the galaxy. So this would be like moving from Mercury to Pluto without any space or time being involved. Instantaneous. Instantaneous. It winks out in one place and winks into existence in the other without any space or time. This is called the quantum leap. And it moves because we look at it, we observe it. And so when we look at ourselves and we observe our situation and we determine where we want the electron to be, do you see? The quantum leap is available to us and we move and light is released. Our light is released. And we become the bringer of light. We become the place where light is being revealed in the situation, regardless of what is actually going on out here. We're actually bringing the light. And we don't have to turn it on. We simply allow it to explode from the very truth of our being. Every positive change, every jump to a higher level of energy and awareness involves a rite of passage. Each time to ascend to a higher rung on the ladder of personal evolution, we must go through a period of discomfort, of initiation. I've never found an, an exception. And so we can begin to make friends with our own darkness. Do you see the darkness is that time while we are in the discomfort and we are allowing ourselves or inviting in the initiation that moves us to, a, to that next level, that releases whatever is standing in the way of our light shining. That rite of passage, that willingness to say, no, no, actually, I choose to show up as love. No, no, really, actually, I choose to show up as abundance and prosperity. No, no, actually, really, I'm not going to buy into whatever that quote-unquote darkness is, whatever that upset or whatever that, whatever that hard thing out there is or whatever that thing that makes me afraid. I'm simply going to show up as the light, as joy, as love, as, as abundance, as peace. To be that, Gandhi says, be the peace you want to see. We bring it, we bring it to it. Ernest Holmes says there's a power for good in the universe and we can use it. This is the power that we use. We don't create the light, we don't force the light. We use it by revealing it, by revealing the truth of who we are and allowing it to flow unobstructedly into the situations. That's why we have people to pray with. That's why we go to practitioners. We go to classes to learn how to do this, to over and over and over again invite ourselves into this place where we recognize that there is this power of love and light. And we can align ourselves with it. And by doing so, we open the storehouse. We open it up. And then what we get to do is we get to stand in the midst of hell and proclaim heaven. <laughs> do you see, this is exactly what happens in the winter solstice. We get to stand in the middle of dark and proclaim light. It's easy to proclaim heaven when things are going well. It's easy to pro proclaim the light when the light is clearly shining and everything's moving forward and we feel all positive and happy and isn't it great and wonderful and oh, it's so easy to affirm the light and to affirm that we live in a loving universe, and yes, in fact, the universe is safe and abundant and all of those things. But what happens when the hits the fan? What happens then? <laughs> right? We, go, we can go into our own darkness. It is in the midst of hell to proclaim heaven. It's in the midst of the darkness to say, no, no, actually the light's shining, and I expect it to come back. And I expect that light to make a difference. I expect it to actually be the love and be the joy that I am. This is the place where I choose to stand, to proclaim heaven in the midst of hell. This is actually only, um, this is actually also the uh, title of a book, and I was going to get the name of the author at break, but I didn't have time. Um, this is actually the title of a new book that's been written. And wait for it, here it goes. 
This is the she the woman who wrote this book is a is a woman Quaker chaplain working with the Marines in Iraq. <laughs> and she wrote this book. I, I believe it's um, coming out in the next month or two. Stand in the midst of hell and proclaim heaven. Do you see that? That is the heart of what we're celebrating in the winter solstice. We're celebrating that in the middle of whatever appears to be dark, whether it feels like it's a lack of finances or a situation with love or the situation in the world out there or whatever it is, from the, from the biggest thing we can imagine to the most fundamental personal thing that we can imagine, if we find ourselves in hell, is to stand there and proclaim heaven, to proclaim the light because the light is always shining, is actually the truth of who we are. This is the reality of our being. You are a radiant, magnificent being of light. You are the place where light and love is being revealed as the individual expression. You are actually exchanging light and therefore the very qualities of that light, love and peace and joy, abundance and wholeness, beauty, you're actually exchanging that all the time with all the people around you. So as we move through this Feast of Lights, as we get closer and closer to Christmas or whatever family part of the holidays you celebrate, you might want to really practice being a bringer of light. Some of those family situations aren't always as easy as we would like them to be, are they? And yet they are the perfect place for us to practice. The perfect place for us to be the light, bring it into the situation. And do you see, when we do that, we're actually raising consciousness. We're raising the consciousness on the planet. If we want the people in Iraq to do that, and the, wherever there are all the many wars and many places where, where people are fighting and contending with the darkness, if we want that to be healed, if we want to bring peace and love into that situation, <coughs> we have to practice it right here, right now, in our own lives. And let your light shine. So I want to close with the uh, second half of the reading for today. Every atom in your body is made up of packets of energy that are photons of light. The higher the vibration at which you are resonating, the healthier and more whole you are and the brighter you shine. The brighter you shine, the more you glow. This allows you to be a bringer of light, a healing presence into any situation or circumstance. You you are the light of the world. No, really. You are the light of the world. Go shine. Let us pray. So just inviting you to take that breath, that deep centering breath. Going within, we take a moment to just affirm and experience that light that we are. Experience the, the reality that that is the truth of our being. And as we imagine it, I want you to see that very light that is the reality of all of the cells and atoms and photons moving around in our bodies. Just um, allow yourself to imagine what that looks like. And begin to imagine that, yes, in fact, you are exchanging photons of light with every person in the room and begin to see that become revealed to your mind's eye and how we are all here connected on that web of light, that light that moves effortlessly between our minds and our hearts. And we can imagine that that's going on between us and with around us and we can imagine that we can spread our idea of imagination of light out into the city and across the state and over the nation and all around the globe, we can imagine touching every point of light, every being, every place where light is shining from each individual. And we feel and see that web of connection 
feeling the light grow in our imagination as it spans the globe, as it cradles it in love and light. This is actually the truth of our being. This is actually what's really going on. And as we affirm this and declare this and know that this is the truth, we release anything that stands in the way of this light, any fear, any doubt, any concern, any belief in any situation that is unlike this light. Because we have revealed this truth to ourselves now. We recognize it, we see it, and we realize this is the truth of our being. And our light shines forth and we are a blessing to the world. We are a gift. And in that, all of life is raised. A higher vibration, a higher frequency. We lift ourselves together into that greater love and light. And we become bringers of peace on earth. And so we revel in it. We allow it to bless us as we are the light and bring the light. Letting it be. And so it is. Mm -hmm.